Amen. Good to see everyone this morning. What a good crowd this morning. How many are glad to be in church today? Amen. How many would rather be in church in the best jail in the area? Amen. Okay. I don't know why people don't raise their hand more than that one. Maybe you have good jail systems. I don't know. But it's so good to be here. I want to thank you, Bill Lawson, for the invitation and the comfortable accommodations. And uh, I slept like a baby last night, sucked my thumb, cried all night. And, uh, my, my wife extends her uh, well wishes. Uh, she couldn't be here. Uh, she just went through meniscus uh, knee uh, surgery. And so she's still kind of recuperating. She traveled with me for a while and then did a little bit too much. And so she's home resting a little bit. She says it's kind of hard to keep up the big dog. <laughs> but in any case, I love my wife. I met my wife, actually, in art school. We thought we were going to be artists. Of course, God changed our mind, but she was working on a drawing, and I walked over. She was 17. I was 20. I said, oh, very nice. She said, oh, you like my drawing? I said, I wasn't talking about the drawing. <laughs> so it worked. Here we are 47 years later, amen? And <laughs> but uh, it's a blessing, and oh my, yes, the Lord is so, so right. He that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. Obtain favor of the Lord. So I'm thankful for that. A lot of times people say, well, Brother Harding, what kind of ministry is this? And I say, well, it's a ministry uh, to our government. And I actually talked to this uh, fact during Sunday school and to the people and, and told them, look, it's very interesting to understand that when Paul was told to go to Ananias and to speak to him, and to allow him to take under his wing. And Ananias was charged by God. Look, you don't have to be afraid of this man. He's a chosen vessel unto me. To bear my name before three people groups. The Gentiles. I'm happy about that, aren't you? Yes. And not only the Gentiles, but to kings. And so he was called as a missionary to government. So if God called him, he can call others. Well, my pastor told me uh, to pray about a God and country ministry. I believe pastors, their positions give them wisdom for you that put yourself under the auspices of the New Testament church more than anyone else. And so I, I believe that and I prayed about that. And God called me, of course, the third people group of the people of Israel. Thank God for the people of Israel. And thank God that our former president, President Trump, moved our embassy to Jerusalem. Amen. Because where God says in the Bible, in the Old Testament, new, he that blesses Israel, God will bless. Yes. And so I'm counting on some of those blessings as well. But it is a blessing to be with you, to meet your pastor, and to meet one of my former students, uh, a young man that worked uh, probably harder than any student in that class that year. And, and uh, uh, Terry, Terry Hickman back there. How you doing, Terry? You doing okay? Is that your son there next year? Okay, I'll talk to him later, okay? If the price is right, I'll tell you some stories about your dad, okay? Yeah. The money's got to be right, though, okay? No. But Terry is always such, such a uh, tremendous blessing, had an excellent spirit. It's good to see him today. It was a big surprise. And so uh, a lot of times people say, well, what's the premise of this ministry? It's five. Number one, to get educated, to know who we are. We are unique in the world, not because we're better than anyone else, because our founding fathers said there is a God. And God gives us certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. All of those are under attack today. So once we get educated, then we get a need to get engaged. We need to pray for these people. We are exhorted to do so in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Exhorted to pray for them. To pray, to, to intercede, to give thanks, to supplicate for them. Why? That we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. And truth has a name and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we do, my wife and I, we go on to Capitol Hill. I was just there this last week and attending a very high level meeting and, and uh, learning some things about what's going on in our country. We have some great challenges, but I want to encourage you today. God's not through with America. God is not through with our country. Now, look, I just very honestly believe that uh, you need to turn off the news sometimes where they begin with good evening and then proceed to tell you for the next hour it's not a good evening. Huh? Yeah. yeah. And open up the good news. Amen. Amen. And uh, make sure everything's filtered through this. If you just had a steady diet of the news, even conservative news, you would think there's no hope for our country. There is hope for our nation. Amen. 
And so we need to understand we can still talk to and pray with these people in Washington, D.C., which I do. And I have had pastors from all 50 states come and pray for their elected officials at one time or another, continuing to do that. And I have founded four God and Country Ministries, Awake America, Capital Connection, the uh, State Capital Initiative, and now Mission to America, where I bring pastors in state by state and pray for their elected officials. It's an amazing thing to see when pastors walk in and sometimes their wives, how that light and the salt makes all the difference in the world with these people, reminding them that they are, uh, number one, supposed to be listening to God, number two, to the Constitution, number three, to their constituents, and then lastly, forget about their career. Our founding fathers never wanted them to have and to be career politicians. And so that's something that we need to understand. But it all starts with education, then engagement, and treating God's mercy. Because although I am so glad that Roe v. Wade was overturned, given back to the state, the battle still goes on. <clears throat> And uh, so we need to understand, we need to be in prayer and treating God for his mercy upon our country. And number four, we need to encourage others to the same so we can do the most important thing, and that is evangelize the lost. To keep this pulpit right here free from any government restrictions. The most important thing for us is to see people saved. Born again, accept Jesus Christ as Savior, walk down an old-fashioned aisle, get baptized in deep water, grow in grace, and reproduce themselves. That's the most important thing. That's how we glorify God. The second most important thing is to hold on to our civil liberty that gives us the permission to accomplish the spiritual liberty that's in the Lord Jesus Christ. We see that right here with this flag right here. Now our heavenly home and our King, King Jesus. And this flag right here, standing for the greatest country in modern history wouldn't be here if that flag wasn't already there. Amen. And so we hold allegiance to both of these flags. This one first, this one second. Civil liberty, so we can go forward with the spiritual liberty that's in Christ. Makes sense, doesn't it? Amen. Sure does. And so, yeah, I bring you greetings from the swamp. <laughs> We're still trying to drain it, okay? Uh, but, uh, hey, it's great to be in the fight. Great to be in the fight. First and foremost, though, it's getting educated as to who we are. Now, I brought two books here, and as long as they last, one is free for every family. An Appeal to Heaven uh, for America. And that is a beautifully designed scriptural prayer for our country. And it basically prays against all the attacks, most of the attacks, anyway, for our country. And I tell people, get this, you know, one for family, and, but don't read it, pray through it. It only takes a few minutes to pray through it every day. And it could mean all the difference in the world if we garner God's attention on our country today. The second one is Bible prayers for revival. And it talks about the principles, the precepts, the promises, and even illustrations of former, former revivals. And it's a prayer every day from Sunday all the way through the rest of the week. The reason why, one of the reasons why I believe we don't have revival is because we're not praying for it. Amen. And uh, to receive the grace that Rose sang about just a few minutes ago. Thank you, Rose, for that song. The grace of God. I sure am glad someone came to me with the gospel of Jesus Christ and showed me that it wasn't anything that I would ever do, had ever done, that would ever get me to heaven. And you can't go to church enough, give enough money, live a good enough life to get to heaven. There's only one way that you can get there. And that is by realizing you're a sinner. And because of your sin, the wages of your sin is death. I used to, you know, think when I was a kid, well, how on earth can a loving God ever, ever send anyone to hell? He doesn't. He doesn't. The wages of our sin send us there. We earn the right to die. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Isn't it great? You can't earn a gift. All you got to do is just receive it. Amen? Amen. And when I received it when I was 21, my, oh my, it changed my life. Not only here, but it changed my eternal destination Amen. and gave me a home in heaven. If there's one person here today, oh, don't hesitate. Even though people may think you're a Christian, you know yourself if you've ever accepted the Lord as Savior. And so I, I want you to, uh, to just be comfortable today and understand, hey, we're, we're here as the body of believers, amen, as the church of the firstborn, amen. And so thank God for that. Uh, and Jesus Christ is that, that person, that God that gives us. Okay, I'm going to turn on my wireless now, okay. Is, is, is it on? Is it on? 
Is my wireless on? Is it on? How about now? Is it on? Is it on? Can you hear me? Turn me up a little bit. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. All right. I have six DVDs that the Lord has allowed me to uh, produce and for the last 20 years. Number one is the Barbary Powers War. It's the fact that the Muslims attacked us back in the 1800s. They tried to destroy our country. And uh, look, their Quran says that there's only one God and he had no son. Oh, I'm sorry. I, there is one God, but he had a son. His son is Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. And his name, our God, the Father is Jehovah. Okay. But they fought us for 32 years. They tried to destroy our country. They were basically kidnapping and destroying our merchant ships. We had no Navy. Our Navy had been Great Britain and we had separated from them. By the time Thomas Jefferson became the third president of the United States, we we're paying millions of dollars to the Muslim nations surrounding the Mediterranean Sea because they were attacking our ships. Thomas Jefferson, I appreciate him. You know what he said? Not one more penny for tribute, but millions for defense. And he took that money and invested it into the Navy and the Marine Corps and they went over and they took care of business. <laughs> And the Marines still sing from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. That's referring to the Barbary Powers War. The Marine officers still carry the Mameluk sword, slightly curved, indicative of the fact that they plucked the sword of violence from the Muslim's hand. Amen. Amen. And they're called leathernecks because they, shoot, they started wearing a big thick collar of leather because the Muslims tried to cut their heads off whenever in battle. Any Marines in here? Because no, there, there you go. Okay. No such thing as former Marines. Amen. Amen. Once a Marine, always a Marine. Amen. That's where they got their name Leatherneck from. So we need to understand. And in fact, Keith Ellison said the first Muslim, I'm the first Muslim congressman ever elected to the United States. No, he wasn't. He doesn't know his history. The first Muslim congressman was a man by the name of John Randolph back in the 1700s. And he was led to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ by a very interesting person by the name of Francis Scott Key. Amen. Isn't that something? The author of our national anthem, personal soul winner. Amen. He was taken out of history. I put him back in right there Amen. in that DVD. Our biblical constitution. Hey, we have a constitution based upon the Bible. Over 20 biblical principles in the constitution of the United States. The most miraculous governmental document ever authored by man. And the reason why it's shortest in its verbiage but longest in its duration over people is because it's biblically based. Yep. Amen? Our nation's capital, a two-minute virtual tour through Washington, D.C., where I take you and show you from the monuments and memorials, this is a Christian nation. And although we're not acting like it in many ways, we are still a Christian nation in our inception. And by the way, there's over 80 million of the 330 million people in America that name the name of Christ, say they had a life-changing experience with the gospel of Jesus Christ, read their Bible every day, go to church every week. And so what we have to understand, hey, we can still do an amazing amount for our country, and God's not through with us yet. The seven foundations of America, the sacred foundations, how can we uphold the foundations if we don't know what they are? And so here are the seven foundations explained in a video format. And the sacred fire of the American pulpit. I love this. Uh, this is a message that I brought during Sunday school, at least part of it. And it shows that the men that signed the Declaration of Independence, that fought for the war of independence, and then came back and did the Constitution, were men that were stirred by the unsung heroes of the war for independence, the preachers of the day, yep. the pastors of the day. And those men would have never signed those documents if it wasn't for the preachers preaching into them that sacred fire. Amen. I don't know about you. That gets me going a little bit right there. Okay. Now, if that doesn't get you going, take this finger, put it right here. Because if you don't feel a beat, you're dead. So please raise your hand so we can carry you out before you start stinking up the place. Okay. Amen. But hey, this is our country. This is our heritage. Amen. And then the miracle of revival. A lot of times people say, well, we started this nation from a revolutionary war. No, we did not. We started this nation from a revival that so changed our colonial population. It was the very glue, the impetus that brought us together to believe that we could, if we get on God's side, that we could see God fight for us. And he did. And our founding fathers were so biblically in their thought and in their life, they said, you know, if God delivered the people of Israel from the tyranny of Egypt, maybe God can deliver the people of America from the tyranny of Great Britain. Amen? Amen. Hey, guess what? He did. We're not subjects to Great Britain. We, we are citizens. Amen? 
and we, we can drink anything we want to. We don't have to drink tea, we can drink coffee. Amen? I've said amen? amen. Are there coffee drinkers in here? Yeah. All right, don't leave me up here all alone now. Come on. Okay. But hey, these are for a gift of $10 a piece. They represent years of study on my part and thousands of dollars of production costs that God has provided. But I offer them to you for a gift of $10 a piece. If you get all six, you get one free. So $50 buys all of those. And uh, hey, that is what you call a real meal deal. Okay. And uh, then we have praying scripture through adversity. This is a book also that's $10. And, and it's a lot of the most beautiful prayers in the Bible, powerful prayers that we can pray. We can pray scripture. And they're all categorized. God is the God of my comfort, my deliverer, my defense, my strength, beautiful um, etchings as well, my refuge, my guide, and praying for others. That is an amazing book. That book will change your life. But if you buy that book, if you get that book for $10, do not read it. Pray through it. Amen. And I'd be glad to sign it because my signature and $5 you get you a cup of coffee right down here. Okay. And so, all right. And then there's two music CDs and they're a gift of $10 to make sure you pick up uh, our prayer card and our website on the back, hundred documents that made America, a lot of free videos as well. And, uh, and then of course we have constitutions back there also. And, uh, and uh, you can pick up a constitution. If you are a veteran, pick it up for free. If not, it only costs a dollar. And so commercial's over. <laughs> okay. Take your Bibles. Go with me to Acts 22, Acts 22 this morning, Acts 22. And let's all stand for the reading of God's word. If you would, please. Acts 22. I want to talk about the stewardship of liberty today. The stewardship of liberty. Now, if anyone knows what stewardship is, it's when someone puts something into your hand that really doesn't belong to you. You're the steward of it. You're responsible for it. You're accountable to it. And we have been entrusted with a very unique thing. Two types of liberty. Number one, spiritual. Number two, civil. And I want to talk about this this morning, Acts 22. And this is Paul giving his defense before the multitude. And he's speaking to them in the Hebrew tongue, so they're paying attention to him. And he's talking about the fact that he was the man that held the coats of Stephen. Excuse me, of the men that stoned Stephen. And he was also the man that met the Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah on the road to Damascus. And he gets to a point where he talks to them and makes a transition as to what God had called him to do. And that's what we're going to pick it up today. So he's talking to them. He's telling them about himself, giving his testimony. He is a scholar because he sat under the feet of Gamaliel. And in verse 21, look at it with me. It says this in verse 21, it says, And he said unto me, this is that dynamic exchange on the road to Damascus. Depart, for I will send thee far hands unto the Gentiles. Now, I'm happy about that. Amen. Amen. And so should you be. It goes on to say, and they gave him audience unto this word. Now, I truly believe that word is Gentiles. Because the Jews thought we were a bunch of old cur dogs. And we were, by the way, heathen. Amen. Amen. We are the wild olive branch grafted in. Some of us a little more wild than others. Okay. <laughs> And it says, look, look at this, and then lifted up their voices and said away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. And as they cried out and cast off their clothes and threw dust in the air, now that's a dead giveaway that someone's upset. You ever see anyone doing that? Get away from them. But the chief captain commanded him to be brought to the castle and bathed that he should be examined by scourging, that he may know wherefore they cried so against him. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, Take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. Then the chief captain came and said unto him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? And he said, Yea. And the chief captain answered with a great sum obtained I this freedom and Paul said but I was freeborn the stewardship of liberty let's pray Heavenly Father we thank you so much now for loving us and dear God as we've come now separating ourselves from the world for this time 
Father, help us, Lord, to still our minds and our hearts. Lord, that you would help us, Lord, to forget about the aches and pains and the troublesome issues of life and to look at and to focus upon eternal truths. Oh, God, bless the reading of thy word, thy sacred word. And, Father, as I step back, step forward. Lord, please, through and by the holy unction of your Holy Ghost, I surrender everything that I am to you, so articulate my lips, clarify and direct my thoughts, most of all, and dwell me with your Holy Spirit of promise, and Lord, that his presence would be here in our hearts, and minds would be open unto him. Father, we'll be very careful to give you all the praise and glory for, we're, for what you are about to do, for we ask this in the precious name of your Son and our Savior, and by the power of the merit and the authority that is the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. So here, can you see that dynamic exchange between Paul, a much slighter man in his physiology and dressed up in the robes of the day? And here comes this chief captain. Now remember, the chief captain is over centurions. And each centurion is a man over a hundred men. So this man is over thousands of legions of Romans. And he comes in, and perhaps uh, scars on his face or down his arms. And all the regalia of a Roman centurion captain, he's got the mail on, he's got the, the red uh, that so you wouldn't see when a Roman bled in battle. And he says to Paul, with a great sum obtained out of this freedom, saying that he brought himself perhaps up to death many times and for some reason God allowed him to live, perhaps for this dynamic exchange right here. And because of that, Caesar had given him his freedom. Paul, though, says something very unique that we could all of us probably say right here. I was free born. Free born. Isn't that amazing? Being born in America, as I told the Sunday school class, we woke up in a miracle today called the United States of America. There is very few people that really think about that when you wake up, isn't it? I mean, did you think, hey, I woke up in a miracle today? No, we don't normally do that. We need to work at understanding that we woke up in a miraculous nation, unlike any other nation in the history of mankind, aside from the nation of Israel. So we have to realize that we have a stewardship of liberty that God's entrusted to us some unique things. And Here's the problem, though. If you've been saved for any amount of time, would you not agree with me if you stop reading your Bible? If you stop going to church? If you kind of lax in your prayer life? Although you're saved and on your way to heaven, can you not grow cold? Every one of us have experienced that at one time or another. So what we do, we run back to God's Word. We get back to our knees. We get back to fellowship. We get back to service for the Lord. We, we go out and we are living epistles of the truth, the absolute truth, which is God. We are here today to remind ourselves that we are going to heaven, that we have been saved. Some of us perhaps here came because you just brought up this way. But here's the thing. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Walking into church doesn't make you any more Christian than walking into your garage makes you an automobile. It's accepting Jesus Christ as Savior. That's the very thing that makes you a Christian, that gives you a home in heaven. And knowing who Jesus Christ is and having him forgive your sins. So we're here today to remind ourselves not to get to heaven because we're going to heaven we're here to worship God, Amen. to thank Him, Amen. to get together, and to look at one another, and to provoke one another into love and to good works. Amen. Amen? So what is that? I mean, that's giving the, the handshake of fellowship. How you doing, brother? It's good to see you. And you know what? I can mean that. Amen? I can mean that when I, hey, brother Van, man, good to see you. And your brother right back here, you're doing okay? Amen. Why? Because we're Christians. Amen. And when we look at one another, we're family. Amen? Amen? We're the family of God. And when we say that and we look at people in the eye and we say, it's so good to see you, that's something that people need. Oh, it's good to see you in church today. Amen? Amen? 
it is iron sharpening iron. Amen. That's why we forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. Amen. 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 You can't do that over the internet. All right. You got to be here looking into one another's eyes. Amen. And so what I'm saying is we're here to remind ourselves what God has done, what he's doing, what he's going to do. Right. Amen. How many, though, times do we celebrate our civil liberty? Very few. Right. And so because of that, I don't think we really have an understanding to the extent that we need to what civil liberty is. From that understanding, maybe an appreciation of the fact that we are free people in a free nation. From that appreciation, a commitment to do something, to hold on to it. I was in Idaho not too long ago, and I talked to a, a Russian that came here and uh, was an immigrant. And he said, I can't believe it. You know, I left Russia coming to the United States for liberty. And he said, but I look around and people just don't seem like they really appreciate it. It's, it's slipping through their fingers like water through a sieve. Why do I said, the reason why is because we've had it all of our life. We've been freeborn. And isn't it just human nature? If you've not done something for a thing, you have to work at appreciating it. If someone just gives you something, you've got to work at appreciating. My dad was a World War II veteran. My dad wanted me to have the things that I didn't have. And so before I was 16, he took me to a police auction there in Virginia, and he bought me a little 1956 Vitesse Triumph sports car. Real wood dash, four on the floor. This was in the 60s, of course, and, and a convertible. We bought it for $60. Those days are gone forever. <laughs> and we put a $25 clutch and pressure plate in it from this catalog. I can't even pronounce the name today. It had everything, all kinds of parts. And we, and we put cross-tread Pirelli racing tires on it. And it was a beautiful little sports car, six-cylinder, one-barrel carburetors. Ran like a house on fire. My dad told me before I turned 16 and got my license. He told me, Rose, I've never received a traffic ticket. I want you to match my record. Well, Bill Lawson, he shouldn't have bought me a sports car. <laughs> because I got my license, turned 16, got my license, and my first ticket. Oh, I was not enjoying my birthday. I went home, told my mama. She said, um, don't say anything to your daddy until he's had his dinner. Smart lady, my mama. And so my dad had his dinner. Everyone was supposed to leave the dining table except for myself and dad. I was going to approach the subject. But my little sister stayed. She wanted to watch the fireworks. And so I approached my dad. I said, dad, I don't think I'm going to quite match your driving record. He frowned and my little sister started giggling. He looked at the joy on her face and the consternation on my face. And he was a smart man. He said, what happened, son? I said, I got my first traffic ticket today. And it was a, a silence as if an eternity. Finally, he said, well, I guess the pressure's off. And it was. <laughs> I knew I was going to live another day unmaimed, okay? And uh, he just saw the humor. In it, and, uh, but in any case, what I'm saying and why I told that story is my, my dad didn't make me work for that sports car. And I didn't have the maturity to work at appreciating it. And so I didn't really ever appreciate it until it was gone. I wish I had it back today. It a beautiful little classic automobile. What I'm saying is, how many times after we lose something do we start appreciating it then? What I'm saying is what we need to do is appreciate the liberty that we have right now. As Americans, and then from that appreciation, have a commitment to do something about it. So I want to give you three things this morning. Three things about the liberty that God has given to us to give us an understanding, appreciation, and commitment to do what we need to do as stewards. Number one, liberty is from God. The origin is from the Lord. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 17, Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty. So the origin of liberty is from God. In every generation, the world has always produced enemies of freedom. They've always attacked America because America's freedom's home and has always been its defender. The reason why, as you well know, we are the land of the free because we are the home of the brave. Amen. Because this is the nation that basically did something so unique. Do you understand how many times 56 multi-billionaires signed a document that would make them a traitor? You know how many times in history that's happened? For people that they would never even know, once, right here, those 56 men 
signed a document knowing that over two-thirds of the country were monarchists. And when they put their name to that paper, they were going to be looked at by men as traitors. But the whole thing boiled down to that one point of urgency in Philadelphia in that room called Freedom. A Freedom Hall. A pastor. One pastor out of 56 men. They were thinking about actually turning it in without any signatures at all. He stood up. His name was Dr. John Witherspoon. He was one of the most well-known pastors of his day. Very old man at this time. And I'm not going to go through his whole speech, but he said this. He said, if every man in this room doesn't strain every nerve to sign that document on that table, you're unworthy of the name free man. He said, of property I have some, of reputation more. Now, he was being very humble because everyone knew who Dr. John Witherspoon was. He said that property of state and the reputation is pledged upon the issue of this my country. And although these gray hairs must soon descend to the sepulcher, I would infinitely rather that they descend there by the hangman's noose than to desert the sacred cause of this my country. He got up, walked over, took that goose quill pen, signed that parchment, which was actually the skin of an animal, prepared for the acceptance of ink, and put his name to it and sat down. Other men started standing up and walking over. Now, now why? Why were they willing to do that? I'll tell you why. Because they realized they were walking lockstep with God and that they had seen something so unique in history. The Holy Spirit of God had illuminated the mind of man and given them a liberty. Hey, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There's never been another nation like our nation aside from the nation of Israel. But here's the problem. We've allowed the natural man to take over leadership in too many ways <clears throat> by us not voting. Huh? And you get this right. A lot of people say, well, I'm not going to vote because they're just going to cheat and my vote doesn't matter. If you think that way, as I told the Sunday school class, that will be a self-fulfilling prophecy. We are supposed to vote. God tells us the lot, which is the vote, is cast into thy lap. But the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. You know what that means? That means God's given us the vote. And we need to vote biblical terms. We need to vote on these people. Number one, you say, well, who should I vote for? Find out where they are on life. Amen. And if they're right on life, they'll be right on 98 to 99% of everything else. Amen. Amen? We need to vote. Get out there. It doesn't belong to us. It belongs to all those men and women that have died Amen. on battlefields to give it to us. Amen. Amen. One of my good friends was Woody Williams. He was the last Medal of Honor recipient from World War II, still alive. 473 men were given the highest honor for valor in our nation under, under fire. The Medal of Honor. Woody was the last one of the 473 men from World War II. There's only about 60 of them alive from all the other wars right now in America. But Woody was 98 years old. And he told me, he said... I want to tell you how I got the medal. And he talked to me about he was a flamethrower and he cleared out seven of the enemy pillboxes on Iwo Jima and how they got so close to taking him out that he could feel the bullets skimming off of his tanks from a machine gun. He just kept on climbing up and ran over and jumped on top of that pillbox and put his nozzle in their air hole and turned it on. Fire came shooting out and went back down and got some more tanks and came up a second time, third time, seven pillboxes. There was enough people that were there that soon he was standing in front of the White House with Harry Truman. Harry Truman came down and 13 of the men lived, 14 did not. They gave out 27 Medal of Honors in that one battle of Iwo Jima more than any other Marine battle in history. In fact, they lost more Marines on Iwo Jima than they did in all of World War I. So Woody came along and, and he said, Harry Truman, President Truman reached around and clipped that medal behind my neck and whispered in my ear, I'd rather have this than to be the President of the United States. Amen. 
He said, then I got nervous. I said, wait, wait. What do you mean, then you got nervous? He was just there at the president's I'm White House. He said, no, no. He said, for a 27-year-old Marine, I was about to go meet the commandant. And to him, I mean, to us, as 27-year-old, he was like next to God. And he was also a Medal of Honor recipient from Guadalcanal. He said, I walked in, and the commandant was signing papers. He said, at ease, Marine. And he put the papers aside, and then he looked at him. You know what he said to Woody? He said, that medal hanging around your neck, son, that doesn't belong to you. That belongs to all those men that didn't make it back home. You're just the keeper. Don't you ever do anything that would disparage the meaning of that medal that hangs around your neck? I said, wow. In fact, I was so excited, I said it backwards. Wow. I almost said it upside down, mom, but I didn't. I stopped right there. But then I thought, you know, that's like the vote to us. The vote. It doesn't belong to us. It belongs to all those people that paid that last good measure. And it actually belongs to the future, like this little one giving me a little challenge back here just a minute ago. <laughs> the future of our country. It belongs to them. Amen. We need to go vote. The duty is ours. The results belong to God. Are you with me? And so we need to realize that, hey, when we don't vote, then what happens? The natural man gets in. Now, follow me now. It says here in God's word, in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them. He's blinded because they are spiritually discerned. So if the author of liberty is the Holy Spirit of God, and the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. How on earth are we surprised that they are for abortion and against Israel and against the Second Amendment and against the free market system and against the traditional family and all the rest of it? Amen. And it's up to us, God's people, to get out and vote and to pray that others will do the same. Go do it. Go do it. I mean, my, oh my. We need to realize some things and understand. Now, by this time, there may be some people in some venues, maybe not here, I doubt here, but you know what they would say? Uh, Brother Harding, I don't believe you're politically correct. Thank you. <laughs> they say, well, I didn't mean that as a compliment. I take it as one <laughs> because I don't want to be politically correct. No. We're about to politically correct ourselves into oblivion. I want to be biblically correct. I want to be constitutionally correct. I want to be historically correct. But it all starts with being biblicists. Amen? Biblicists. Oh, wasn't Jesus? Didn't he come to give peace on earth? And shouldn't we all be holding hands, singing Kumbaya? <laughs> Well, when they say that to me, I say, well, let me tell you what the Lord said himself when he was here in the flesh in Luke 17 and verse 51. The Lord said himself, quote, suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth? I tell you nay, but rather division. End quote. Ooh. Why? Because light divides from darkness. That's right. And salt from the putrefaction of sin. Amen. It says over and over again. So there was a division among the people because of him. And there was a division therefore again among the Jews for these sayings. What do you think some of those sayings were? Well, the Lord summed it up this way. Very effectively in John 14 verse 6. Where the world says, oh, there's a lot of different ways to God. Jesus said, I'm the way. Amen. The world says, oh, there's a lot of different truths here and here. The Lord said, I am the truth. Amen. And if you didn't get that. He said, I'm the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's only one name under heaven we can call upon to be saved. That's Jesus Christ. He is who he is. That's why we need to have the right position, the right disposition. Hey, I had a, I had a blind cousin. His name was Johnny. He was five years older than me. I can still remember. It's etched into my mind. I can close my eyes and see the scene before me. I'm five. He's ten. Five years older than me, and I, unthinking five-year-old, tell my blind cousin, Johnny, isn't the sky blue and the grass green, Johnny? What's green? I tried to describe 
green to Johnny. I was shocked as a five-year-old. I couldn't do it. I couldn't put green into words that he could understand. Why? He had no frame of reference from which to believe. You understand? That's why the left wing, the people that hate God, they're for baby murder. How can they be that? Because they're blinded. And really, they're not even the enemy. <coughs> they are the patient. The enemy is old smutty face that's using them like a pawn. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they're soldiers in his army, so you can say in that extent, yeah, they are enemies in that extent. But what I'm saying is, hey, folks, I mean, they're, they're against the Second Amendment. Are you kidding me? Second Amendment predates the Constitution. They, I mean, <coughs> that's the reason why we weren't attacked in World War II by the Japanese, because they said behind every blade of grass and every stone there's a well-armed American. Amen. Amen. I like that. I, I, I enjoy that. I, I lived in Oklahoma for many years uh, in the ministry before I relocated back to Washington, D.C. And uh, boy, we, you know, we had the, the, uh, the uh, concealed carry. They, now they have open carry, but in those days, concealed carry. And there was a lady, a very nicely dressed Christian lady. She was going from Oklahoma to Texas. And, you know, there's reciprocity. If you've got a concealed carry in Oklahoma, they honor that in Texas. And she crossed over the Texas border, and she was on her way to see her grandchildren. So she was kind of motivated, okay? And she broke the speed limit and she was pulled over and she was so nervous she gave the uh, state trooper this Texas state trooper her concealed carry permit instead of her license <laughs> and the guy looked at her and here she is this petite lady and she said oh I'm sorry officer that's my concealed carry permit here's, here's my license he said well ma'am do you have weapons in the car she said oh yes officer I have a 357 Magnum in my glove box I have a, I have a 45 underneath my console right here uh, uh, oh yeah I have a 22 Magnum in my purse and uh, oh, oh I have a sawed-off shotgun stuck underneath my dashboard he said ma'am what are you afraid of she said absolutely nothing and that's America but that's why they're against it because they're blinded you see We have a glorious inheritance, every one of us. We need to honor it, a special sense of that great legacy, and become living illustrations of what it is, number one, to be a Christian, number two, to be a patriot. There's no, nothing wrong with the term nationalist. I'm a nationalist because I believe in America. I believe in America first before anyone else. That's nationalism. And don't tell me it's not spiritual, it's not scriptural. The Lord Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. Spiritual liberty. He also wept, as I told the Sunday school class, over his nation's capital of Jerusalem. When was the last time you wept over your nation's capital? The Lord did. Number two, very quickly, liberty must be guarded. It's fragile. Etched and granted upon one of the foundation blocks of the National Archives building in Washington, D.C., attributed to Wendell Phillips are these words. Listen. Eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. I want to ask you, have we been eternally vigilant? No. We've allowed God and the Bible and the Ten Commandments to be withdrawn from our public school systems. They're not educational. They're now indoctrinational. They're indoctrinating our young people, telling them uh, that socialism is, is good. Hey, socialism is just communism with lipstick. Socialism is the most failed ideology anywhere in the world, any time in history. It's, it's ridiculous. The lies that are being told to our young people, the 1619 Project, it's just completely ludicrous what's going on. What took a monumental effort to obtain takes only a careless lack of concern to lose. And we've not been good stewards of our liberty. It's time that we get back to the place that we need to be and get educated. Oh, don't miss tonight because I'm going to the next step this evening. But very quickly, let me get finished here this morning. Before we look at our country, do you understand history is his story? And history shows us what's coming. And Rome was not taken over by a army mobilizing without. They were rotted from within. Let me give you just three quick things from a book called The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon in 1787. Listen to this, three things very quickly. Number one, ancient Rome. See if you can see it in America today. The rapid increase of divorce. The undermining of the dignity and sanctity of the home, which is the basis of human society and increasing obsession with sex. 
you know, why the transgender and the same gender and all that. It, it's all against the traditional family. Right. Why? Because as the family goes, so goes the nation. That's right. As the family goes, the family is what the church is made up of. That's right. Amen. Higher and higher in taxes, spending of public money for free bread and circuses for the populace, and increasing desire to live off the state. Ancient Rome. See that in America today? Yeah. The welfare system. Look, I understand that some people need it. Most people don't that are on it right now. And they need to get off and get back to work. Amen. And, and hey, I mean, even our forefathers knew this. Benjamin Franklin said, they that can give up essential liberty to obtain temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Another man said it this way, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. That's Galatians 5.13. First, second Peter, excuse me, two and verse 18 and 19. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, emptiness, they allure through the lust of the flesh. Through much wantonness, America has become wanton. We want free this and free that. And every time you want something free from the government, you have to give them freedom in exchange. And that's never good change. Never good exchange. It says... Those that were clean escaped from them who live in air while they promised them liberty. They themselves have serve, are servants of corruption. So, number three, very quickly. The mad craze for pleasure. I wonder how many people, st Christians, Baptists, stayed home and watched the Super Bowl on Sunday instead of coming to church. Huh? Uh, sports becoming more and more exciting, more brutal, enthusiasm, pretend to be creativity, freakishness in the arts. Freakishness. My wife and I, we've gone to the National Art Gallery in Washington, D.C. I know which galleries to go into and which ones not to go into. But I stumbled into one that was a revolving display of nonsense. So what are you talking about? It looked like someone tripped over buckets of paint and splattered on the canvas and they hung yeah. it up. And, and there were two people talking in this particular gallery. So I walked over because I wanted to see what they were talking about. Yeah. And there was a self-proclaimed authority and some of them wanted to know. And they were looking at this splattering of paint on this canvas. So I walked over and listened to what they were saying. And then one person said, what is that? And the self-proclaimed authority said, oh, that's a great work of art. Oh, ah, how much is that worth? And the self-proclaimed authority, oh, that's uh, priceless. Well, well, what's that entitled? That is entitled man's in a struggle with self. And I feel like saying, yeah, and he lost right there. Because <laughs> it looked like someone got sick on a canvas and they hung it up. It's garbage. What, what, what do you think that is? Oh, it's whatever you think it is. No, no, that's humanism in the visual form. There's absolute truth. That's what our Bible is talking about. And we're supposed to be epistles to absolute truth. Art is supposed to display absolute truth. Shows you where our country is. My, oh my, we need to understand. Number three and last, true liberty always comes with great personal sacrifice. Liberty is always birthed in blood. John Adams to Abigail, November 1778, quote, It seems to be the intention of heaven that we should be taught the full value of our liberty by the dearness of its purchase. How does someone gain liberty? Someone else is willing to put their life on the line for it. They put liberty above life. 56 men signed the Declaration of Independence. Only six of them made it back to sign the Constitution. Many of them died from battle wounds. Many of them never saw their families again. Many of them were in abject poverty. And I'm talking about the wealthy elitists, as some people would call them. They weren't elitists. They were always considering the common man. Not trying to control them, but considering them. I've had some wonderful things, basically, that God's provided me. After seeing a particular war movie, I said, Lord, I, I'd like to go over to Normandy. I'd like to see where this happened. I'd like to see where those Marines, those Force Recon men ran in on D-Day. I didn't know how God answers prayers. He always answers them exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. So I didn't know that not only was I going to go there, but I was going to be sitting next to a veteran from D-Day. 
he was 84 at the time. This was years and years ago. And we flew from Dulles, Virginia to Cannes, France, seven hours through the night. I'm sitting next to a guy that was living history. I kept on asking questions. What about this? What about that? Every once in a while, knowing he was 84, I said, Bill, you want to get some sleep? He said, no, you have another question? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I kept him up all night long, poor guy, you know. But by the time we had landed and then drove down to Normandy, we had been acquainted somewhat. And we stood on a beach that we had named Omaha. Yeah. I looked behind us, and the cement bunkers where the Nazis were shooting at our men were still there. Those bush hogs, those girders that they had put into the sand, badly rusted from the 1940s, but still there. Bill was standing there. And I had just been told in a documentary, within the first 15 minutes, 190 men died. Just the first 15 minutes. By day's end, 2,000 had fallen for liberty. Day one. So I'm there with Bill. I said, Bill, I've never had anyone shoot at me in battle. It was almost like Paul with the chief captain. I need to work at appreciating the liberty that these men, represented by those tombstones, died in order to give to me. And Bill, I could tell, probably didn't normally talk about this. See the wheels moving. He said, well, he looked out into the water. He said, as far as the eye could see, every ship and boat of description he said, sometimes the sky was almost seemingly overcast with planes to bring in men and munitions. He said, I know I didn't get in on D-Day. It must have been D-Day plus one. Because when we rolled in on that Higgins transport boat and the plank went down, the bodies of our men lay all over the beach in every imaginable position, floating in the water, their lifeblood ebbing out. He said, we tried to be as respectable as possible, stepping over the bodies of those men that had silenced those machine guns. Some of them were still alive. They were moaning. So we started scattering throughout the beach and cradling their head and giving them some life-saving water and doing whatever we could for them. There were other medics. There were medics there, but not enough. Our commander came over and very quietly but very firmly said, gentlemen, these men must wait for the next available medic. Our orders are clear. This is far from over. We are to push in and engage the enemy. When Bill told me that, I said, what is it in the American serviceman's mind and heart? that allows him to run into the face of certain death to the report of a machine gun. He sees his friend run out before him. He's gone through boot camp with him. He's seen photographs. He knows where he's from. He knows his aspirations in life. Photographs of mom and dad and brothers and sisters, maybe sweethearts or even wives and children. And he sees his friend that helped him get underneath that barbed wire over that wall fall and give his life for a few feet up a bridge. And he follows and runs past his still body and he gives his life a few more feet. There's someone following him that is his friend. And he passes his, his still body and over and over until they get up to that beach wall and are able to attack and disarm those bunkers where those machine guns are mercilessly mowing our men down. I said, what puts that in the American serviceman's mind? And I just started praying. God showed me. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Oh, I, I'm thankful that I'm free from the tyranny of man. I'm very thankful for those veterans that have paid that last good measure. I'm thankful for anyone that's ever served our country. But I'm infinitely more joyful that I'm free from the tyranny of sin, from its penalty. I was under a eternal death penalty from its power. I don't have to live under the power of sin anymore. 
And one day from its very presence when the Lord calls us home. Because the greatest sacrifice that they emulated on those beachheads was Jesus Christ when he died on the cross and shed his blood for your sins and mine. Perfect blood. We're all of one blood, but his blood is perfect. We're all of one blood, but our blood is tainted. And his blood covers the sin and washes it away. My mom and dad, they did a pretty good job at Christmas. I mean, they tried to give us everything that they could. My sister and I lived upstairs. She had one side, me the other. And, and Christmas morning, she'd lower me down by the ankles <laughs> to see if the gifts were there. Because we weren't supposed to go down until the gifts were there. And so I'd say, they're not there yet. And she'd pull me back up the stairs. One particular morning, she let me down the stairs and I said, they're there. She got excited. She let go. <laughs> I had a head start. I went over and there were gifts with my name on it. You know, I can remember my earliest recollection, five years old. I didn't have sense if my name was on it. That was, that was mine. And if it was underwear, it'd go over my shoulder and I'd go to the next one, okay? Or something to wear. I wanted toys, right? And I'd unwrap it and unwrap it. There was never a time where I saw a gift that I knew someone had loved me and had bought it with my name on it that I ever said, I don't want it. I had enough sense when I was five. My name? Oh, yeah. I want it. Give it to me. At the age of 21, someone showed me the greatest gift ever offered to mankind. Oh, had my name on it. Yes. Wrapped up in the blood and the sacrifice of my Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And he would have come and died if it just had been you. Hey, I, at five years old, I wasn't going to walk away from a gift. At 21, when someone showed me it was, it was a gift, and, and how do I get this? How do I accept it? He said, well, it's free, but you need to understand you're a sinner. Oh, I know that. The wages of your sin is death. I said, what does that mean? You've earned the right to die. Okay. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And all you need to do is turn your back on your life and start living a new life in Christ. You know what that's called? That's repentance. Turning from your way to God's way. Well, I'll never be able to live a Christian life is what I thought. He said, no, you won't. But when you receive Christ, he'll live his life through you and give you victory over everything that you could even imagine. I accept him that day. Hey, we have an amazing country because it's based upon a reflection of the spiritual liberty in Christ. It's not a perfect reflection, but my, oh my, it's the most miraculous country in the world today. So I have two invitations for you this morning. First one is this. When was the last time you wept over your country? When was the last time you walked down an old-fashioned aisle and said, Lord, I'm just coming to thank you for putting in the heart of someone before me to die so that I could live free? There were teenagers that lied about their age, 16, 17 years old. Bill was 18 when he rolled into Normandy, just turned 18. Running into the face of certain death. Could we not walk to an old-fashioned altar this morning in humility? Thank God for the liberty that we have because of their sacrifice. And the second and most important question I have is, who are you today that's here? The gift is yours. It's eternal life. Jesus died on the cross, shed his blood. Your name's on it. Are you going to walk away from it? Or will you come forward and accept it and allow someone to show you how you can know for sure when you die, you're going to heaven? The stewardship of liberty. The future belongs to us. It doesn't belong to the heathen. All eyes closed, all heads bowed. Who are you today that would say, Brother Harding, I don't know for sure when I die I'm going to heaven, but I'm positive I don't want to go to hell. I never knew that God had given me a gift that all I needed to do was just 
accept it by admitting that I'm a sinner. Because I've sinned, the wages of my sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And all I have to do is just be willing to turn from my way to his way. Oh, I want that. Brother Harding, pray for me. Here's my hand. Lift your hand up. Let me pray for you. anyone like that today. Lift your hand up. Don't know for sure when I die, I'm going to heaven. I see that hand. Yes, thank you. Anyone else? Take some courage. Well, people think I'm a Christian. Hey, the great white throne judgment is something you don't want to face. Where it'll be too late then. Where God says, depart from me. I never knew you. One raised to their hand. Anyone else? Say, Brother Harding, remember me in that prayer. Remember me. I don't know for sure what I'm, when I die I'm going to heaven, but I want to know. Anyone like that today? Lift your hand up. Let me pray for anyone like, like that. All right, the one that just raised their hand, look right, right up here at me. You want to know for sure when you, when, when you die you're going to heaven? Okay, good. I want you to come in just a moment and let a lady take the Bible and show you how you can get saved. I would say, Brother Harding, something else that you said touched my heart today. Here's my hand. Here's my hand. Someone else, something else that you said today touched my heart. Here's my hand. When was the last time you got to an old-fashioned altar and prayed for our, our country? And thank God. I'm going to ask you a little different of an invitation today. I'm not going to ask the piano to play. I'm just going to ask you to stand right where you are. Stand right now, right where you are, and look right up here at me. I'm going to ask the piano not to play. But I'm asking you right here, as other people ran into certain death, if you would please stand. When was the last time you came to an altar and thank God for the liberty that you have as an American? I'm just going to ask you to come right now and join me and let's pray and thank God for our country. Would you come? Others ran into death. Can you not come in humility? I don't normally go to the altar, Brother Harding. Might be a good time to start. Oh, might be a high time to start. Saying, Lord, please have mercy on us. Oh, God, thank you for my country. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. See, God says, if my people should call by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. This is what they're doing. Best of God's people at the old-fashioned altar doing God's best work. Anyone else want to join them as you come today? Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Say, Lord, please have mercy on us. Thank you for our country today, Lord. Thank you for those unnamed people that would never appreciate, that would never be able to, I should say, participate in liberty that died for its purchase. Heavenly Father, we bow before you today, a grateful people, for that your death, the death of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, on the cross. And then, Lord, how you put that sacrifice that so defines us as Americans into the hearts of servicemen and women that have given that last good measure. Help us to be thankful to do something for it to be back tonight so we can understand what we can do for our country. So much more that we can do. We can't even imagine the ramifications that could happen if we just get to where you want us to be. So Father, bless. Undertake now and thank you for loving us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.